about you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Ashok Vaid. I work at the Medanta Cancer Institute. And on behalf of the Indian Oncology Foundation and the entire team Medanta, led by Dr. Nitin Sood for this event, who he is the program director, I welcome you all for this edition of the Lymphoma Day presentations. It's been a tradition with us since the year 2002, barring only one year where we, we could not do the program. So probably this would be the 17th or the 18th edition of the World Lymphoma Day celebrations. And as promised, we bring you a very innovative and a novel program. And there will be three lectures and a panel discussion looking at topics which are uh, interesting and of the beat. I thank everyone, particularly Nitin, Amrita and Roshan for putting in their hard work, doing all the networking, putting such an excellent program. I thank the lead sponsor for the day, Intas Pharmaceuticals, and the entire team at Nucleus led by Rajesh and Neera and others who have done an excellent job. Without further, any further ado, I will hand over the proceedings to Dr. N for uh, taking you through the introduction to the program and starting kickstarting the program and the lectures and the discussions. Thank you so much. Over to Nitin. Thank you, sir, and good evening, everybody. And thank you for joining us for uh, this Lymphoma Day. And uh, we are trying to raise awareness for lymphoma. Uh, thank you for all the panelists for joining us uh, right on time so that we can start the proceedings and we can finish in time for dinner. Uh, so uh, our first lecture is by Dr. Roshan Dixit. And uh, he's going to talk, us, talk to us about uh, the recent changes that have happened in the lymphoma area. Uh, so that we can all learn from him about what's going to happen in the lymphoma space in the coming few years. So over to Roshan for the first lecture. Roshan, we can't hear you. Uh, hello, sir. I'm just sharing the screen, sir. So okay, great. great. So is my screen visible to all? Not yet, sir. No. Not yet, Roshan. <clears throat> is it visible now? No, sir. Should I share the screen from my side? Okay. Perfect. Is it now? Yes, yes. Yeah, now we can see it, Roshan. Put it full okay. screen, sir. Hello. Good evening. Okay. okay, sir. Perfect. Uh, we can see your screen now, Roshan. You can go ahead. Okay. Good evening, everyone. So, today my topic will be the uh, new frontiers in the management of non Hodgkin's lymphoma. So and I'll be focusing on the B cell lymphomas since that's where most of the advances are happening and uh, would really push the frontiers for personalized and uh, tailor-made therapy for the patient. So relapse and refractory B cell lymphomas are a major treatment challenge as we can see in our patients who come to our clinics. And a significant proportion of these patients seem to be refractory to rituximab at the time of relapse, which is of concern. And uh, many of these patients have poor outcomes at relapse due to inabilities to tolerate toxicities due to the therapy. And so novel approaches has been designed in, to avoid toxicities and target the disease by entirely different approaches. The more effective chemotherapy regimens, new monoclonal antibodies, radioimmunotherapy, adoptive T-cell immunotherapy have greatly improved lymphoma management in the last few years. Since malignancies evade the immune system through alteration of surface antigen expression and T cell exhaustion, so these mechanisms have really been used to target these, anti, uh, these malignancies 
and the success with immunomodulation has been seen with allogeneic stem cell transplant when graft versus leukemia effect shows the way for the adoptive T cell therapy and immune cell targeted monoclonal antibodies. These approaches are really promising in the management of relapse and refractory lymphoma, some of which may be really heavily pretreated and which otherwise is an area of dismal prognosis. Coming to the first therapy, which really sparks a lot of interest whenever it is spoken, and uh, we are really unlucky that we didn't, don't have it in India yet. So, RT cells, as we know, are autologous T cells, which are modified to express chimeric proteins, which are expanded in vivo and then reinfused into the patient. These RT cells can recognize tumor antigens independent of the major histocompatibility complex and activate T cells, leading to tumor cell death. And co stimulatory molecules CD28, 4, 1, BB for T cell proliferation, survival, and persistent anti tumor effect are integrated into the CAR T cells. So, the development of CAR T cells has been going on since the last few years. Well, the first uh, designed around 1993, but it did not have the advantage of persistence in the body and uh, uh, for. Uh, continuing action, and that's when second generation CAR T cells and the third generation CAR T cells came to place. And in 2002, we uh, we found the second generation CAR T cells, on which actually majority of the approvals of FDA's have come around 2017, in which this gen Leclusil was uh, approved for uh, CD19 CAR, which was approved for pediatric ALL and non-Hodgkin's B cell non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. So, a brief diagram about how actually CAR T cells are uh, uh, generated. So, usually uh, uh, these uh, T cells which are uh, uh, collected from the patient are usually modified uh, by introducing a lentivirus or a retrovirus vector containing the CAR T cell construct which has a variable chain which is the outer membrane portion of the T cell. It has the transmembrane domain, which lies here, along with the intracellular T cell activating domain, which is coded by the CD28 and the uh, delta chain. So, uh, this is actually then uh, transfused into the patient. And then these T cells, into which we introduce this CAR T cell vector, starts expressing the chimeric antigen receptor, which recognizes the targeted. Uh, tumor cells and causes T cell activation, causing in death of the tumor cells. So, over a period of time, we have uh, produced various generations of CAR T cells. As I told you, the first generation CAR T cell just had the extracellular domain in which the antigen was recognized, the in transmembrane domain, which conducted the impulse into the intracellular domain, causing T cell activation but it did not have the advantage of second generation CAR T cell in which a co-stimulatory domain of CD28 was integrated causing persistent T cell activation and interleukin production which maintains the T cell in the circulation for its action to go on. Because as you know, T cells are terminally differentiated cells. So in the absence of a co-stimulator or an interleukin like interleukin 2, uh, they will exhaust from the circulation. As and when our knowledge uh, improved in the uh, production of CAR T cells, we started integrating more advantageous molecules like uh, integrating another co-stimulatory uh, signal that causes the same T cell activation, but more potent. To, in the fourth generation CAR T cells, we started integrating uh, uh, new genetic sequences that would cause additional interleukin production that will cause proliferation and maintenance of T cells in circulation. And the fifth generation CAR T cells produce, uh, means act also on other pathways of tumor proliferation, like the Jack Start pathway, causing their inhibition. So, additional ways in which you can control the tumor proliferation and uh, tumor signaling. So, going through the presently uh, licensed products for uh, uh, CAR T cells. We have the TISGEN Lecalucid, which is uh, licensed for pediatric, NH, uh, pediatric uh, B cell ALLs and non Hodgkin's lymphoma. And it has also been tried quite successfully in DLB cells and follicular lymphomas 
with quite impressive overall response rates in relapsed refractory settings in which patients are heavily pretreated and expectancy of life is quite low. Uh, there are other molecules targeting CD19 like Axi-Captagene Silodusil, which is the Escarta product, which was quite successful in the Zuma-1 trial with overall response rate of 83% and a complete response rate of 58%. Uh, Lysocaptagene Marilusil is another uh, uh, product which is quite effective in diffuse large B-cell, primary mediastinal B-cell, follicular and transform follicular lymphomas with good overall response rate and complete uh, response rates. So as and when we give CAR T cells, we do recognize that they come with their own problems like cytokine release syndrome, which is present in about 10 to 15% of patients, and neurotoxicity, which is related to the cytokine release. And these really remain a challenge. So as and when our knowledge progressed, we started redesigning the CAR T cells so that uh, the rapid T cell expansion and the systemic perturbation of immune system is corrected. So to mitigate that risk, we started uh, modifying the endogenous CD3 complex and redesigning the T cell activating receptor so that the cellular response of proliferation and the immune system perturbation is actually a bit dampened. So these redesigned CAR T cells have less propensity to cause cytokine release and B-cell exhaustion. So but the next thing in the market is bispecific CAR T cells. So it was seen that why not target two antigens in, in place of targeting only one antigen. So there are multiple phase one and early phase two studies which usually show good efficacy if you target both CD99 and CD22 which are consistently expressed on the B cells. There are CAR T cell studies in which CD19 and CD20 both have been targeted in relapsed refractory settings. And uh, there is a phase one study currently undergoing in which CD19, CD22 bispecific CAR T has been combined with a consolidation therapy with anti PD1 pembrolizumab. So the next uh, thing on the horizon are armored CAR T cells. So uh, it, it tends to help to mitigate the risk of lack of persistence and expansion of CAR T cells by blocking the immune suppressive environment. So it has been engineered with both the co-stimulatory uh, co molecule CD28 and 41BB. So it's essentially the second generation CAR T cells. The next uh, thing on the horizon is antibody coupled T cell therapy. So in this CAR T cell construct, what happens is CD16 has been integrated into the CAR T cell uh, uh, the antigen receptor. So what happens is uh, we give an antibody like uh, rituximab or trastuzumab, which targets the antigen, the tumor antigen. And once it has coupled with the tumor antigen through the CD16, the FAB portion of the antibody is recognized by the CAR T cell. And then it adds to the T cell activity through this coupling and causes intracellular downstream signaling. So this is a summary of whatever I spoke about the new uh, methods of mitigating the toxicity of CAR T cells and also increasing the efficacy that is by specific CAR T, the armored CAR T cells and the antibody coupled T cell receptors. So uh, after the CAR T cells, although it preceded the CAR T cells, the use of bi specific T cell antibodies has been uh, uh, encouraging in non Hodgkin's lymphoma. Uh, they have all they have a documented efficacy in uh, acute lymphoblastic leukemias. So, uh, planar as we all know, is a T cell engager. We simultaneously link CD3 and CD19. And uh, it causes, it synergizes and complements the T cell mediated cytotoxicity with antibody dependent cellular toxicity. It has been used with impressive single agent activity in follicular, mantle cell, and DLB cell relapsed refractory disease. Mosnetuzumab, which targets the CD3 epsilon and CD20 receptors, has also been shown to have good uh, benefit. The next uh, 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 mode of uh, therapy of interest are antibody drug conjugates. 
So these combine the cytotoxic potency of, of a chemotherapeutic agent to a target specific monoclonal antibody. So there are various molecules which are currently under investigation like ADCT402, which targets CD19 and SG3199. Uh, it's targets CD19 and delivers SG3199, which causes DNA cross-linking. And it has been seen to be strongly potent in CD19 expressing cells. ADCT301, that is camidanlumab decidin. So it utilizes CD25 to tag these cells and delivers the PVD toxin. And it has been used with encouraging results in heavily pretreated Hodgkin's PTCLs, CTCLs, and NHLs in which CD25 is consistently expressed. This is a summary table of the uh, uh, bispecific antibodies and the antibody drug conjugates. It has been seen to be used in a diverse population of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma patients with uh, impressive overall response and satisfactory complete response rates. Polatuzumab vedotin, as we all might have heard, is a CD79B directed antibody drug conjugate, which has been indicated in the combination with entomastine and rituximab for adult patients with relapsed refractory diffuse large vessel lymphoma. After at least two prior therapies, it delivers monomethyl oristatin, a microtubule inhibitor. It has an uh, acceptable side effect profile with peripheral neuropathy and CR rate of 40% and an overall response rate of 63% when combined with metamedicine and rituximab. Unfortunately, it's still not available in India too. Uh, this is the JCO article which showed a definite improvement with polatuzumab and metamedicine in progression-free survival and in the overall survival. There are other uh, experimental therapies which are also currently under investigation that is macrophage mediated phagocytosis in which uh, CD47 is utilized for inducing phagocytosis of the tumor cells through macrophages by unmasking pro-phagocytic signals and engineering toxin antibodies in which cancer cells are targeted by immunotoxin scaffold with an antibody uh, binding to uh, We all know immune checkpoint therapy and we have very uh, uh, good experience in uh, solid tumors with uh, in immune checkpoint therapy and in Hodgkin's lymphoma. And such similar experience has also been seen when it has been used in relapsed refractory Hodgkin's lymphoma as in the solid tumors. So since there is high frequency of 9P24 gene alteration and increased PD ligand expression, so it makes classical Hodgkin's lymphoma quite responsive to the immune checkpoint therapy. Uh, and the rare 9P24 and uh, poor uh, PDL1 expression in B cell lymphomas are actually uh, uh, is because it is its use is not too much in non Hodgkin's. But there are few trials in DLBCL in which these have been combined with other antibodies and targeted agents like meliridomide and copaxin. Uh, small molecule inhibitors like the PK inhibitors, ibrutinib and acalabrutinib have been approved already for uh, CLL, mental cell lymphoma, marginal zone lymphoma, and Waldenstrom's. And uh, there are other investigatory products like M758, which is a highly potent selective second generation inhibitor. We have phosphoinositol 3 kinase inhibitors, which have been used in similar settings, and uh, some other uh, experimental products, which are also in the pipeline. So this is a summary uh, table of the uh, uh, small molecule inhibitor which are currently being used and having some response in uh, uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Uh, these are my references and uh, I'm open to questions. Thank you so much. So thank you, Roshan, for finishing on time. And uh, uh, I think we have some time for questions. So any questions from the, from the audience or the panelists? Now is the time to ask. But while we wait for questions, Roshan, I yeah. think that was a great presentation. I think yeah. Dr. Subhash has a question. Yes, Dr. Subhash. Uh, Subhash, you're on mute. So can you unmute? Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's uh, that was an excellent presentation, Roshan. Uh, thanks for Thank that. Thank you, Dr. Subhash. Uh, yeah, and I've heard that uh, 
polituximab is available on uh, 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 compassionate use uh, in india with uh, who's that rosh is it yeah so as of now polituximab is not currently uh, uh, available on compassionate since we found out for one or two of our patients so they're not supplying so maybe around one year back it was available yeah uh, rajiv gandhi institute did give it to around two or three patients uh -huh. but uh, it's not currently at the present situation it is not available and specifically because of the import restrictions it is not uh, coming in right right so we were, we were also offered pola at one point about a year ago but because of yeah. legal problems i think we couldn't uh, open that compassionate use program in medanta uh, but uh, polituzumab was available for the indication that uh, for relapsed lymphomas who were non transplant eligible so the older relapsed lymphomas uh it was available and uh, in combination with bendamustine rituximab so i think what they wanted was to rosh wanted to introduce pola and uh, they uh, wanted some sort of data to present to dcgi so they were giving it on a compassionate basis uh to for this specific indication mm -hmm. but they pulled it now and it's about to be introduced in the in the open market but i mean uh, the major use would be in again relapse post uh, uh, autograph rather than in uh, no uh, uh, the initial trial was actually for patients who are not eligible for mm -hmm. autograph so mm -hmm. i think that is the uh, uh, that is how they got the mpa approval because that the indication that they want to market it in india for uh, in combination with bendamustine rituximab in relapsed lymphomas who are not eligible for autograph not eligible for mm -hmm. autograph mm -hmm. right So, what's your experience so far in using uh, uh, a combination of ibrutinib and chemotherapies in refractory uh, DLBLs? So, I feel it is uh, means I have not treated much in that way, but anecdotal experience of uh, use in maybe few patients, but uh, we haven't yet noticed any. I recently put two of my patients, but I I cannot say that it is really effective to combine ibrutinib with this one and. Uh, not much impressive that's what i think okay 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 so fortunately we are running on time i can allow one more question uh if there are none then that is good news roshan you've done a great job uh which means there are no questions um thank you there is a there was a lot of uh, car tea in your uh, in your presentation but unfortunately we have no access to it so uh, really a comment it's, um, not uh, it sounds it sounds very exciting and once i re once you read into it it actually spurs a lot of interest that yeah this can be done so less side effects and uh, the persistence of car t cells in b cells really encourages that there can be long term responses also in car t cells so obviously that's very yeah. and i hope that it comes possibly very expensive and um not available at the moment and that's the main problem yeah access to it i don't know when um but there'll have to be some sort of decentralization into carti production for it to be effective yeah so since there are no further questions i would I would invite myself now to do the presentation on. Uh, so the next one we've got is uh, primary mediastinal lymphoma, and there we go. So can you see my screen now, everybody? Yes. Ah, uh, perfect. Right. Okay. So um, what I wanted to do with uh, my fifteen minutes was uh, present. media cell or primary media cell Hello. not bc sir so sorry but yeah. anything sorry to interrupt you we can't see your screen right now you can't we cannot see you can, then we cannot see your screen yes now we can see that right okay you put it on slide show anything now no still not sir no not not this way right okay i think when i get into presentation mode that's where the problem comes in uh so you can see it now right right yeah. this this is visible 
Right. Okay. So I'll I'll keep it on this mode and uh, try and do the presentation through this. Uh, I'm just going to make the slides slightly bigger so that you can see better. Uh, so what I wanted to do with my 15 minutes was uh, present media cell, primary media cell, large B cell lymphomas, and uh, because there is a lot of um, there is a lot of controversial areas in this uh, in this topic, uh, what I wanted to do was. Uh, try and convince the audience that uh, this is a separate subset of lymphomas, that it's not the same as diffuse large B cell lymphomas or another category of diffuse large B cell lymphomas. It is a distinct subset and we've got a lot of genetic and otherwise evidence uh, to say that it is a different subset which needs its own treatment and has its own prognostic implications. Um, the standard of care uh, in primary medicine large B cell lymphoma used to be our shop. Uh, but the infusional uh, epoch therapy has recently gained a lot of interest amongst physicians who treat lymphoma. And uh, that's because of uh, one of the trials which was presented in 2013. And since then, things have changed a lot. And it's primarily because this, this is the sort of lymphoma that presents in younger individuals, especially females, and we're trying to get radiotherapy off the shelf or, or off, the, off, the, off the treatment plate here. Uh, so, uh, we start with uh, some of the uh, epidemiological data and it's not a very common one. It is only 7% of all diffuse large B-cell lymphomas. Uh, uh, when it Nitin, could I, could I interrupt you? Sorry. Nitin, could, could I interrupt you? Yeah, your, your voice is cracking. Could you, could, your voice is cracking. Could you switch off your video? It, it might become better. Right. You, okay, so. I'll do that. Just give me one second. Oh, I think somebody's done that for me. Yeah, okay, my video is gone now. So 7% of all diffuse large B cell lymphomas are what primary media cell lymphomas are. Uh, and when they, they do happen, they happen in a uh, predominantly younger population and uh, they're all, uh, and there is a, a lot of female preponderance uh, in this age group. Uh, the median age group for this sort of lymphoma is third to fourth decade as compared to uh, the diffuse large B cell lymphomas, uh, which are much older, um, which present in a much older uh, age group. So they arise from the thymic B cells and which is why they're kind of extra nodal aggressive B cell lymphomas. Um, and as I said, they're a distinct entity. They're not a part of, not same as diffuse large B cell lymphoma, just present in the chest, which is a separate entity on its own. Uh, and um, you can see large size cytologically atypical lymphoid cells uh, with abundant, to pale, abundant pale cytoplasm in the background. Uh, to to and then a histological diagnosis is not very difficult in this form of lymphoma. Uh, so if we look at the age distribution, uh, on the left is diffuse large B cell lymphoma, activated B cell type, and the GCB type, and on the right is primary media cell lymphoma. As you can see, median age is much younger, and majority of patients that present with this form of lymphoma are younger in the age group. So when you're presented with a with a media cell mass, you've got to uh, you've got to make sure that one of the three the top three diagnoses are the classical Hodgkin's lymphoma, which again present in the same age group. Uh, but from an immunohistochemical point of view, the Hodgkin's lymphomas, as you know, are 15 and 30 positive and 20 negative. On the other hand, the primary media cell lymphoma is 20 positive. And occasionally, 30 positive, uh, occasionally has weak CD30 expression, uh, but it's 15 and 30 negative usually. Uh, and of course, the similarity between the two is that the JAK-STAT and the NF-kappa B pathways are upregulated in both the malignancies. But between these two malignancies is the mediastinal gray zone lymphoma, which is a newer entity, a relatively newer entity. And as you can see, um, again, the other way of looking at mediastinal gray zone lymphoma is that it is an entity which is somewhere in between the primary mediastinal and the nodular sclerosis Hodgkin's lymphoma. 
So if we look at genetics, uh, and you can see this genetic spread here, uh, the molecular diagnosis of primary mediastinal B cell lymphoma, uh, and on the left is the gene expression. Sorry to interrupt you again. I think your slides are not moving. My slides are not moving? Yeah, I think this right. is still stuck at uh, slide, slide number three or two or three. Three or oh, four. Okay. Right. Yeah. So I think there must be some problem with screen sharing. I'll, I'll stop sharing and then share again, start sharing again. See if that solves the problem. Okay. Uh, can you see the slide with the gene expression profiling on it? Yes, it's visible now. Right. Hopefully, it's visible it should, now. Yeah. Hopefully, it should move with uh, with my presentation now. So, the molecular diagnosis of uh, this type of lymphoma. Uh, is entirely different from the diffuse large B cell lymphomas. As you can see on the left, uh, the expression of the top panel of genes uh, is, uh, is completely red in the PMBCL category, which is left, and green in the diffuse large B cell category, which is on the right. And you can see that the bottom panel is entirely different. And you can see the bottom. I put uh, all the diagnosis at the bottom so that you can make out the difference between the two. And now if we come uh, primary mediastinal lymphomas, they look much more similar to Hodgkin lymphoma as compared to they look to uh, the GCB or non-GCB type of diffuse large B cell lymphomas. So hopefully the slides are now moving uh, with my presentation. Uh, now, if you're faced with a primary mediastinal lymphoma, uh, the top four diagnosis that you need to consider is the diffuse large B cell lymphoma, which has got a mediastinal mass, a mediastinal gray zone lymphoma, which is a relatively new entity, uh, which looks histologically and immunohistochemically uh, somewhere in, in between the diffuse large B cells and the, uh, and the um, Hodgkin lymphoma. And then there is the primary mediastinal B cell lymphoma, and finally, there is the classical Hodgkin's disease. So a mediastinal mass, either of the four diagnostic possibilities are there. And it is important to distinguish uh, all the four because what we need to do is because they are very, very different in terms of progression, very different in terms of prognosis. And of course, the treatment of all of these lymphomas is, is, is different. And uh, we've got to choose an appropriate regimen uh, based on the age of the patient age, performance status, etc. So uh, uh, making a diagnosis usually is not very difficult. Uh, we take a biopsy from the media cell mass and look at the tumor morphology. Uh, we run an immunophenotype. And as I said, uh, CD20 positive, 15 negative, 13 negative usually um, would be what primary media cell lymphoma looks like. Uh, sometimes they can have weak expression of CD30, uh, but then there are other markers in case we get do CD30 or a MAL protein, uh, sometimes even a PDL1 uh, to differentiate between the primary media cell B cell lymphomas and the Hodgkin's, and sometimes even the diffuse large B cell ones. They generally express the pan B cell markers. And in imaging, one of the clues is with the primary media cell lymphomas, they are generally localized to the chest. Uh, they don't go outside the chest, which means it's usually a stage two disease. So the clinical presentation usually comes with a huge media cell mass. There is, uh, there can be a, a, a superior vena cava syndrome, and you need to be aware of that. Uh, patients can present with facial and arm swelling and dyspnea, especially dyspnea, which gets worse with lying down and with positional changes because there is additional compression because of gravity, uh, and they also present with cough and chest pain. Uh, so the clinical presentation is variable, uh, but sometimes generally it's stage one or two. Uh, CT scans would pick up a huge mediastinal mass, usually a conglomerate of a lot of lymph nodes which are stuck to each other. If we do a bone marrow, which we generally end up not doing, uh, the bone marrow is not involved. And because of their young age and limited disease, uh, they are generally low in IPI. 
so a word of caution uh, we have to make sure that it's not a systemic lymphoma with mediastinal in involvement and even more importantly it's not a nodular sclerosing classical hodgkin lymphoma and uh, sometimes histologically they can mimic each other very well gray zone lymphoma can only be picked up with immunohistochemistry and it is mandatory that uh, we realize that our and then ask a pathologist to run a proper immunohistochemistry on our, all our patients so the problem with this type of lymphoma in choosing a treatment option was and still is that uh, they are so rare that we don't um, uh, we don't have a lot of evidence to back our treatment decisions and to that end all of us used to use our chop and because they were uh, in the mediastinum and the disease was generally bulky uh, we used to add radiation but as you can imagine that becomes a problem when they present uh, in a younger age group and especially uh, they are females and because females uh, can have increased risk of breast cancer with radiation there was an urgent need to get radiation off the plate uh, for the treatment of these diseases so um, the trial that first uh, looked at primary mediastinal lymphomas was the mint trial if you remember this is the math thera international trial which brought in rituximab that uh, cemented the position of rituximab uh, in aggressive b cell lymphomas and what they did was they looked at a subset of patients and did a subset on 80 patients who had primary mediastinal lymphoma uh and uh, so so the ones that have our chemo uh did much better and especially had uh, you can see the um, uh, three year event free survival uh was 78 versus 52% and overall survival was 89 versus 78% and there was a trend towards improvement with rituximab so rituximab had cemented its position not only in the uh, aggressive b cell lymphomas but also in this category of lymphomas so the next trial was uh, the uk ncri uh, arch of 14 versus 21 trial uh, and in this trial they did a subgroup analysis of 50 patients with pmbcl and this is the first trial that introduced the concept of intensification and the concept of intensification in this category uh, of a subset of lymphomas and it generated so obviously arch of 14 um, and 21 if you remember was equal in all other uh, dlbcls so arch of 14 became another uh, option for most people uh, who wanted to get through treatment quicker uh, but it had a lot of more lot more cytopenias but in this subset of patients uh, you had 50 pmbcl patients and um those 50 did much better with arch of 14 as compared to arch of 21 so this is the this is the trial that really brought in the concept of intensification and if you intensified chemotherapy uh that you could get better results in this subcategory of patients so to that end um people wanted to do more intensive chemotherapy for this subset this subset had its own peculiar peculiarities where it could tolerate uh intensification very well especially infusional protocol so an infusional protocol called those adjusted epoch was introduced uh and this this was the original article uh, and the study from nci group which was published in new england journal uh, and they looked at the dose intensive infusional chemotherapy program plus rituximab uh and uh these the results were published in negm and as you can see event free survival uh in the nci cohort versus the stanford cohort uh and the nci cohort was prospective uh and the event free survival was almost 93% with overall survival well above 90% at a median follow up of 63 patients uh and the stanford patients which were only 16 uh but the uh, interesting thing was that the event free and overall survival there was 100% um and even at a follow up of 37 months overall survival remained 100% so this trial one of the major problems was if you give infusional doxorubicin and keep escalating uh, doxorubicin and and topside would it have effect on your cardiac ejection fraction and as you can see uh, these are plots of ejection fraction compared to uh, compared to time 
uh, orange on the top and green at the bottom before and after chemotherapy. And as you can see, there's very little difference uh, between uh, before and after uh, ejection fraction. So the, the worry that uh, the ejection fraction would drop with such, uh, such intense protocols wasn't really substantiated. Uh, so the baseline characteristics of patients <clears throat> and predominantly females, predominantly younger patients, predominantly uh, extra, very little extranodal disease and, and uh, a very little stage four disease. So that uh, cements the position that this disease is very different uh, to the other diffuse large B-cell lymphomas. So the conclusion was uh, dose adjusted epoch, although this was a single arm uh, trial with only 50 patients and some of them and then 16 patients being retrospective. Uh, but it gave us enough to say that dose adjusted epoch um, was, was something that could obviate the need of radiotherapy in this category of patients. So um, <clears throat> a retrospective analysis was done. Uh, and it was a multi-centric retrospective analysis in most of the most of the centers were in North America uh, and 156 patients were pulled um, all adults and children and all all had received dose adjusted epoch between 2005 and 15 and uh, had reached level four and this one showed that a progression-free survival uh, of 87% and an overall survival of 97% was achievable for this form of therapy. And since this is retrospective, uh, this is real-world data, and uh, you can extrapolate that to say that this is something that which can which we can achieve in our clinics with a very high certainty. Uh, so MD Anderson did its own retrospective analysis. And in this retrospective analysis, they compared R they, they compared various types of chemotherapies and RTROP, HCVAD, I don't know what that is, and R epoch were compared. And the interesting thing is um, that all of them gave a very high response rate. And but the thing of note here is thing to note here is that RTROP, majority of patients who had RTROP had also had radiotherapy to the chest. Uh, although only 20% of EPOC had radiation. So although high overall and event-free survivals achievable, there was no statistically significant difference between our CHOP and EPOC. Another retrospective analysis, 132 primary mediocinal lymphomas, 12 North American centers. And he said you could achieve a high CR rate with the dose adjusted EPOC, but at the same time, toxicity was higher. So there was no overall survival difference, which goes to say that, uh, again, there is mixed evidence that we're getting here. Uh, obviously, the only answer would be by getting a head-to-head -head trial between the two chemotherapy agents, uh, but we don't have that answer yet. So another retrospective study, um, this time 15 years, 124 PMBCL patients, RTROP versus RTROP with radiation and uh, dose adjusted EPOC without radiation. And again, there was no difference found between RTROP radiotherapy and dose adjusted EPOC, although RTROP was inferior. So the evidence is a bit mixed, but the single M 2013 trial uh, showed that our EPOC was giving us much higher response rates than we expected from RTROP which is why, as you can see um, from all these centers, uh, which were doing our job before 2013 April, when the trial was published, had changed over and very few centers remained with our job. So most of the centers changed over uh, to EPOC. Uh, so for future, um, the trial areas, um, now that we understand a lot of disease biology about this, uh, we know that Jack stack signaling pathway is, uh, is involved in the pathogenesis of this disease. The NF-kappa-B pathway is abnormal. Uh, we can target the JAK-STAT pathway. We can tra target the NF-kappa-B pathway with bortezomib or proteos proteasome inhibitors. Uh, there are certain targetable surface markers. So brentuximab, the anti CD30 antibody. And of course, as Roshan said, we've got CAR T cells and we've got rituximab to target CD20, CAR T cells to target CD19 protein. 
and uh, the um, the PDL axis also is abnormal, uh, so we can use PDL one inhibitors. And these are all the research areas, and I'm sure we're going to uh, see a lot of this coming in the near future. So to conclude, um, I just want to say that this this is a different biological entity. Uh, it's closer to Hodgkin lymphoma as compared to uh, the diffuse large B cell lymphomas. Uh, dose adjusted epoch is a feasible treatment can be done and uh, it's a treatment that we can safely and easily deliver uh, in our inpatients um, and because this is a category which is uh, younger and which are females uh, we have to try and avoid radiotherapy to the chest although our shock with radiation remains a viable option and for centers who can't do infusional protocols for whatever reason uh, it does remain our shock with radiotherapy remains a viable option. So with that, uh, I want to thank you for, uh, for your attention and for listening. And if there are any questions, I'm quite happy to answer them. So I'm going to stop my uh, Before that, Nitin, before that, let me take this opportunity to thank you for that uh, excellent lecture. Very insightful, very educative. And, and you have dealt the entire issue from a very practical standpoint as well. I, I thank you indeed for, for this wonderful lecture. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Nitin. Yes, Subhash. Um, so, uh, dose adjusted epoch, and how many dose escalations have you done so far? What's your maximum one? So, we start with the the level zero, which is the yeah. uh, milligram of doxorubicin yeah. and you know the rest of it. Uh, and we are able to, I mean, the younger ones, we are able to go to level two. Okay. Um, so that's the maximum you can go. Hmm. Or you can go to minus one and minus two if you're not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, the maximum we could do was probably one and we escalated to 1.5. I don't know. There is no one. Uh, I don't think you can do 1.5. Yeah, you? but uh, we did uh, try uh, doing it. But um, our, uh, from, from all the studies which we can, I think you can safely, if you're not able to escalate beyond uh, uh, one, apparently that's okay. But the most yes, critical component is probably the infusional chemotherapy. Yes, that's right. That's right. That's, that's I mean, the 90 star infusion app apparently is the most useful one. Is that what you found? And uh, uh, and the biggest problem in the dose adjusted epoch or uh, most of the lymphomas are such. I mean, apart from the Hodgkin's, is uh, the response uh, response assessment PET, which happens to be a major problem in many of those uh, mediastinal lymphomas. Yes, I'm, I'm glad you brought up the end treatment PET because the false positivity of the end treatment PET is fairly high for media cell lymphomas. Mm. And again, you need to have a very experienced PET physician and probably see the PET scan yourself, have a low threshold for a repeat biopsy or maybe even uh, sort of repeat the PET in six to eight weeks. <clears throat> because media cell is such an area, it's very difficult to interpret. Plus, there's a lot of inflammation going around, especially after radiation. Uh, so the false positivity is very high with the PET scan, especially. So that is one of the very controversial areas mm. uh, is the entry to PET scan. Now I didn't include that in my talk because I didn't want to uh, confuse the issue. Uh, mm. But uh, the end treatment PET is one of the areas that needs a lot of research in the future. Mm. Nitin, Nitin, can you hear me? Uh, sir, I can hear you. Thank you for joining. Uh, th thanks, sir. Uh, uh, just want to ask you, uh, someone who has gone on a zero level or someone has gone on to level one or two or three or the whatever levels, is there any difference in the outcome has been analyzed? Uh, the people who could achieve this level? Or... No, I think uh, it's more important that you give the infusional, uh, the infusional chemotherapy. Uh, now, the, the point is, I don't think we've analyzed the difference. We've not even reached to the state where there has been a head-to-head -head trial between EPOC and Darchok. Uh, the, the ones that I showed were uh, retrospective analysis with their own confounding problems. Uh, so there is no head-to-head -head trial. I mean, forget about reaching levels that that kind of evidence is just not available to us. No, but is there any retrospective try of this? The, the reason is, 
uh, you how much to push for so you are yeah. always worried about the relapse and and that at the same time the tolerability so yeah. how much do you push it you can push it for the level 2 and you can treat it like a aml put it into the ward and do it whether it is required yeah, yeah. or not. no no but uh, the uh, so again there there is no evidence to say that the higher you go the more uh, the more you get uh, but again i think we shouldn't push too much because uh there is the nadir neutrophil count and the nadir platelet count that you've got to make sure that you don't cross um and to make sure that uh, you know the febrile neutropenia growth factor usage all that we have to be very careful about anyway sure sure thanks thank you so there are two questions from the panelists i'm just going to read those uh from from the from the uh, audience what about overall survival Well, in progression free survival between die epoch and archop from primary media cell yeah so i think we've answered that anyway uh and um, so one of the questions is what is the treatment choice in uh, hiv patient with pmbcl so and to covid 19 patient with pmbcl so gosh that's a very difficult one so hiv patient with pmbcl uh, remains the same as uh, to to the best of my knowledge remains the same as hiv patient with uh, uh, aggressive hodgkin uh, aggressive non hodgkin lymphomas which means that if the hiv is uh, in good control you can use rituximab uh, but usage of rituximab in uncontrolled um, hiv becomes a big problem and infections uh, increase quite quickly uh so i think we should not use rituximab in that area uh, in that in that situation uh but of course try and get the hiv under control as soon as you diagnose it uh once you've got a good cd4 count and a low viral load then rituximab can be used um the covid-19 pandemic um now i don't know i mean covid-19 pandemic with pmbcl uh that is a different that's slightly tough question i would no if you ask me i would sorry sir you you rescued me <laughs> we had a one patient who was a young guy uh, during the our dipoc he had a covid so he went to the covid ward a uh, lot of toxicities uh, so he had a significant problem uh, he was already on dipoc and that was a life last kind of a cycle uh, but i think uh, uh, probably one option is to go on archop and rather than going intensive on that so that's my suggestion yeah but i guess the question is would you start diepoc if somebody was to diagnose Probably. no if it's clear if lungs are clear ct scan is normal the hrct is normal then probably yes but someone has has a lung abnormality probably that's my opinion go yeah, low i don't think there's a right or wrong answer here yeah uh, so with that um i want to invite dr amrita ramaswamy uh who is my colleague and a good friend and she is going to moderate a panel um what i want to do is uh, if she can introduce the panelists and tell us about the cases she is going to present so over to dr amrita i'll just start screen sharing in a minute uh... Can you see my screen? No. No. Still. You are not able to see your screen. No, not not yet, Amrita. Okay. Can you see my screen now? Still not. Sure. No, still nothing. Um. Nilav, can you help? Yes, sir. Yeah, I can hear you. Hello. Ah, hello. Ah, ma'am, should I share the screen from my side? Yeah, please do. Just a sec. Yeah, please go ahead. 
Yes, we can see the screen now. Yeah. Thanks, Neerad. And uh, before I begin, I would like to uh, thank Dr. Ved and Dr. Sood for giving me this opportunity to uh, moderate this panel discussion. Uh, this panel discussion would be on extra nodal lymphomas. Uh, and uh, for this panel discussion, I would like to invite the panelists. Uh, can we have the next slide? We have Dr. Dinesh Burani from uh, Rajiv Gandhi uh, Cancer Institute, Delhi. We have Dr. Anil Aribandi from Hyderabad, Dr. Chejian Subhash from Chennai, Dr. Balakrishna Padarte from Mumbai, and Dr. Sitara Manandram from Bangalore. Uh, welcome to all the panelists. Um, so extranodal lymphomas, they constitute around 30% of all non-Hodgkin lymphomas. And unlike other lymphomas, they sometimes do require site-specific strategies for diagnosis or a therapy. Um, the, con the, the definition of extranodal lymphomas continues to remain a bit controversial. The true extranodal uh, lymphomas and uh, the appropriate staging system also remains a little controversial. So moving on to the first case in the panel discussion, can we have the next slide? So we have a 65 year old renowned endocrinologist in Faridabad. He presented to the emergency with complaints of headache for the last 20 days and uh, seizures involving the left side of the body. Uh, one episode for which he was actually brought to the emergency. On careful questioning, his wife revealed that there had been subtle behavioral changes over the preceding three months with uh, some irritability and uh, uh, temper tantrums. He has well-controlled hypertension and no other comorbidities. Can we have the next slide? So blood investigations were done to rule out metabolic causes, but then we were dealing with focal seizures, so metabolic causes are slightly unlikely. Uh, the, they were as expected within normal. MRI was done, uh, MRI with contrast was done, which showed a large expansile um, enhancing mass lesion in the corpus callosum, which was suggestive of either uh, infiltrative high-grade glioblastoma, the other differential was a corpus callosal lymphoma. Uh, he was started on steroids by the neurosurgery team before a biopsy was attempted. Uh, can we go on to the next slide? So the patient uh, underwent right parietal craniotomy with tumor excision by the neurosurgery team and the histopathological examination revealed a diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. He underwent PET-CT on the advice of the medical uh, oncologist with contrast, which did not show any hypermetabolic focus elsewhere in the body. His viral markers were negative and um, the diagnosis was primary CNS lymphoma, DLBCL. Can you have the next slide? So what further staging investigations would, should be done ideally in this patient? And uh, is there a comment on starting steroids before biopsy was attempted? So um, my question could be, anybody in the panel could take this question. Um, Dr. Sehlian, please. Well, yeah. Uh, the, the problem with uh, 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 non-exposure to steroids before biopsy is extremely difficult to convince anybody. A patient who comes in with a, a, a raised intracranial pressure with a, a CNS symptoms this has been a running uh, problem with most of the neurosurgical team and uh, 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 the end users like us where the uh, things come up as uh, uh, lymphoma. Apart from lymphoma, the, the uh, CNS uh, uh, malignancies generally have uh, 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 retained their pathology uh, uh, with or without the uh, steroids. So their instinct is to actually give the steroids before they actually take them up for surgery. It makes the surgery so much easy for them uh, to do that. So I, I don't think we will get any uh, uh, biopsy uh, uh, without steroids from a neurosurgical team, unless this patient comes direct to us, which is very unlikely. So I think we have to live with what we have uh, got. The one thing which uh, uh, we need to uh, uh, make sure that they do is, 
as soon as they plan for uh, 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 steroids, they need to have a plan for the biopsy. And that's all we can stress there. Rather than five days or a week of uh, 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 steroids and then biopsying it and making them to neurologically improve, they should have both of them at the same time, which probably is the only one thing which we can use. The smaller amount of steroid exposure they have, the better for us uh, uh, later in the uh, uh, disease treatment as well as uh, 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 your uh, 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 diagnostic samples. Further investigations, I think uh, an MRI with a gadolinium, which probably is a very good uh, test. And uh, uh, probably uh, as soon as they have, uh, almost all the centers now have a PET CT scan. As soon as a malignancy is suspected, I agree that the CNS disease have a, 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 a difficult uh, way to interpret for uh, malignancy. Uh, uh, to uh, rule out a, a primary tumor elsewhere in the body, like a PET CT scan, is extremely useful. For me, I don't know what others think. Even before a biopsy, I I agree with uh, Dr. Subhash. Uh, we should still have educational sessions. Try to encourage them to have a biopsy before the steroid. But many times the situation is uh, you cannot avoid the steroid. So I, I fully agree with him. Investigations we have to have ophthalmoscopy and um, yeah testicular examination uh, apart from MRI and uh, PET scan to rule out the systemic disease uh, and the metabolic uh, investigations. And, uh, if you pick up steroids before you did a biopsy, if patient, uh, um, most of us are aware that we hardly have a patient who is not on steroids when they present to us. So would you interrupt steroids? before you attempt the biopsy or would you continue to do the biopsy or go ahead with the biopsy even though the patient is on steroids? Dr. Subhash? Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, if the uh, biopsy is going to be done in the next day or two, it becomes very difficult to uh, 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 give a, a steroid-free interval before the biopsy. So if there is a plan, I think I would just go ahead and do the biopsy. It can be done tomorrow or the day after tomorrow. Can we have the next slide, please? Amrita, the other thing is there are a couple of investigations we have missed. One is CSF. You have to do CSF for uh, cytology and flow cytometry. And second thing is definitely I will be doing bone marrow biopsy for all these patients. Again, sometimes we want to rule out uh, what's a, uh, secondary lymphomas, secondary before you should consider doing. CSF analysis and bone marrow analysis. So I think that pretty much completes the entire list of staging investigations which any primary CNS lymphoma should uh, undergo. So we have the list on screen. Um, so this has been covered by all the members of the panel. And uh, in addition to desired treatment, I think we should do a DTPA GFR and an echocardiogram to assess the fitness of the patient for treatment. Can we move on to the next slide, please? So coming to treatment options. Um, so for this particular patient, 65 year old with well-controlled hypertension, no other comorbidities, who's got a, a corpus callosum lymphoma. Um, let's say his echocardiogram is normal with a normal ejection fraction. And uh, his DTPA GFR is uh, 70 ml uh, per meter square per minute. Um, what treatment or what would be your, what would be the treatment that you would offer this particular patient? Uh, Dr. Amrita, just, just before the treatment option, there's one thing from the uh, options which I probably thought was uh, HIV and uh, EBV serology would be extremely uh, uh, useful. Useful, yeah. correct. Uh, I thought that probably would be uh, a one a major one which uh, we should always look for. I think you have put viral, yeah. yeah, but uh, in specific HIV and probably EBV as well. Uh, yeah. yeah, HIV is definitely going to change your treatment plan. How you think about you are going to treat, particularly considering the possibility of autologous transplant, even though he's 65 year old and fit. So definitely HIV and EBV both I would do in addition to all investigations that you are suggested. That's correct. So, sorry, yeah, uh, go on. Go on. Uh, sorry, Subhash, how would uh, uh, EBV change your uh, approach to the patient? I yeah, agree with the HIV. Apart from get, getting some more information with EBV, would that change your 
management of food uh, uh, the addition of uh, rotaximabs and other things are extremely useful with an uh, ebv serology um, mm. Anyway, we are going to do if it's a CD20 positive, we are going to use rituximab, but uh, yeah. addition of uh, rituximab probably is extremely useful uh, uh, EBAR or uh, LIP1 or uh, uh, EBV expression on the uh, biopsy. But Shubhas, for all lymphoma patients, we give rituximab. Yeah, yeah, vitamin R is there, yes, uh, I do. <laughs> <laughs> so there is one more thing to EBV in patients with primary CNS lymphoma, it is that if the EBV positivity is there, the histology can be slightly different. Particularly, uh, no, majority of patients of high, uh, you know, CNS lymphomas are high grade diffuse large B cell lymphomas. But in patients who have EBV positivity, there is slightly higher incidence of classic or atypical Burkitt's type of histology in these uh, people. So, prognostically, it is relevant uh, in addition to how you treat people, particularly if they are young. Uh, so, how you, what do you talk to the patients and the relatives? Uh, that is the, that differs if you have EBV and histologically, if it is different, that diffuse large B cell lymphoma. Dr. Sooth? Is he there? No, I'm here. I'm here. Yeah, I'm there. There. So, would you agree with uh, doing an EBV serology on uh, primary CNS lymphoma? Uh, we, we don't routinely do EBV serology. It's routine practice. Well, we, we don't routinely do it, uh, but I mean, if there's a problem or if we were suspecting something unusual, then we would do EBV serology. Uh, but as you know, as you said, I mean, uh, I, I, I proceed to uh, pathologists will routinely do, do EBR and uh, EBR other, on the uh, I presume. Um, in case of Hodgkin's, I guess, uh, but non Hodgkin's, I don't think they do EBR fish, EBR ish anyway. Um, so I, I, I don't think routinely we would do EBV if that's the question. Mm. Uh, rituximab obviously would be routinely added anyway. Mm. And uh, so when you said the EBV, Subhash, you meant EBV PCR or uh, uh, just no, no, the pathology specimen itself, most of them will do. Oh, you mean EBV on the pathology specimen. Okay. Yeah, correct. As well as, I mean, serology would be very useful, particularly as uh, uh, Dr. Balakrishna said, uh, be very useful in HIV patients too. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, use it as a surrogate marker for your uh, uh, other pathological diagnosis. But yes. Yeah. Bala, without yeah. EBV also I'll tell my prognosis with the primary CNS lymphoma is very poor. <laughs> I know, at 65 years of age, yes, you are right. <laughs> yeah, go on. Sorry. So, uh, moving on to the treatment option. So, uh, anybody from the panel, uh, Dr. Burani, uh, what treatment would you offer this 65-year-old doctor? who has no other comorbidities apart from hypertension, which is well controlled. He's got a good DTPA, GFR, a good renal clearance, creatinine clearance, and a normal echocardiogram. We'll prefer a chemotherapy first, uh, or a chemotherapy alone therapy, rather than a radiation or a combination. Pre preferably the chemotherapy first, or only chemotherapy. Uh, rituximab will be definitely added. Uh, probably I may not go intensive therapy like uh, matrix and all, probably will be more intensive in his uh, age, I haven't done it, so it's not that is not recommended. Uh, I, I'm very comfortable with the DeAngelis. Uh, it will be definitely may not be effective as a matrix, but my preference first will be a um, so methotrexate high dose methotrexate based chemotherapy along with the rituximab. There are two three protocols. There are no head to head trials. Uh, probably a younger age uh, matrix kind of a thiotepa and other uh, combinations. If it's an older age, uh, probably a DeAngelis kind of a RMBP. Dr. Anil, would you like to uh, take that question, please? I mean, what would you offer this patient? From my side, I usually I prefer high dose methotrexate at the reduced dose uh, and with addition of rituximab. But instead of radiotherapy, I would prefer some chemotherapy. I will go with more trimazolamide and uh, th that oral drug rather than uh, radiation because I find radiation to be more uh, neurotoxicity in this age group. So you would go more uh, in favor of an MTR kind of protocol mm -hmm. in which you combine high dose methotrexate with rituximab and temozolomide. And especially with matrix, usually I've seen very toxic matrix. Usually I prefer for young patients, but not this age group. So anybody in favor of dose reduction of matrix, like can we omit the fourth cytorabin dose or reduce the dose of thiotipa and still do matrix in this patient? 
uh, i don't know about matrix and other things but our standard treatment is either uh, uh, um, high dose methotrexate on its own at 3 to 3.5 gram per meter square plus obviously uh, uh, rituximab and any young patients we generally add if it's a primary serous lymphoma with no uh, 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 but this is elsewhere uh, i generally add in uh, citrabin i don't use thiotipa uh, uh, at all we simply use uh, methotrexate and citrab uh, just uh, with rituxan with rituxan map uh, most of us have done extremely well with just citrabin and the two most potent uh, uh, cns parenteral drug in our armamentary for all leukemias and lymphomas is actually citrabin and methotrexate and uh, i'm not very comfortable in adding thiotipa into the uh, matrix uh, but uh, i don't know the personal choice i i'm, I'm happy with me the trexet on citrabin citrabin at 2 gram per mid square uh, we have used matrix in a couple of our patients younger fitter patients in medanta but um, as uh, um, pointed out by most members on the panel i think it's a very intensive regimen and it's not for the old it's only for the fit and young and even then i think what what was the higher what was the higher age for the matrix had been used in the trial i'm not aware so what was the, the age group of matrix in trial i think the cutoff is 7 so it was a it was a 70 trial Yeah, you are talking about the matrix phase two trial, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so what, that's what was the operation? Was the uh, I think it was in the one of the Nordic countries, uh, and the IESLG group did this phase two trial, um, and the matrix protocol was tested. I don't think there was a head-to-head -head trial, uh, but they they no. capped the age at sixty, and uh, they got they got very good results. But it was a single arm trial, so because it was not compared to anything. the evidence remains questionable but if you look at the overall responses were very uh, very good with the matrix protocol and uh, so even they acknowledged in the trial that uh, it's very difficult and it's a very toxic regime and that you have to introduce irc gradually so the first cycle is usually at reduced doses uh, but thiotipa in adding thiotipa to the whole uh, mix of uh methotrexate rituximab uh and rsc uh, will obviously help and escalate the responses uh the only thing is with the dose of methotrexate most of us use 3.5 grams and i think anything less than that is not useful but if you have i or cns disease you can go up to 8 grams or uh, 8 grams per meter square uh but obviously you know the toxicity increases and i wouldn't recommend that in this age group anyway Where methotrexate, a single agent methotrexate uh, along with rituximab is uh, extremely useful, and that's probably is the most important drug. The methotrexate probably is the most important drug in the whole uh, lot of CNS lymphoma. And yeah. you are uncomfortable with any of them. I think single agent uh, uh, methotrexate along with rituximab is probably extremely useful. Dr. Burani, just a quick question: Is there any difference in there are people who used to use higher dose of rituximab uh, for uh, uh, better CNS penetration? Is there any evidence which you can uh, think of? Say, some people use up to 750 milligram per meter square. I don't know, and uh, how useful it is to have a bigger dose of rituximab for CNS disease. I think the most of the trials are with the higher doses of uh, rituximab. Uh, uh, is there just a penetration is the, the concentrations you achieve is uh, uh, effectively uh, achievable so uh, as i am aware most of the trials are with the higher dose nitin uh, are you uh, uh, what i am aware is the higher dose uh, so uh, no sorry i missed the question is uh, how much the lowest dose you can go for the rituximab and I think anything less than 3.5 grams is no no rituximab he's talking about oh rituximab oh i see okay um So usually is a higher dose the maximum is 3 the standard 375 500 mg per meter you can no, no you get you give 375 mg per meter square for two days means like that. two doses yeah. two doses yeah two and there is uh, subash without a single agent usually the cr rates are less around 30% and obviously when you use matrix i have used in young patient matrix mm -hmm. the main issue is cytopenias and recently we have transplanted a patient on uh, thiotipa mm -hmm. uh, conditioning 
and the uh, plated engraftment it took longer time around more than 40 days for us and i mean there are quite a few number of people from uh, 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 yorkshire and a very popular regime there is called hydram with hydrobusin which has got a better penetration but i i haven't been able to use hydram in uh, india at all and uh, um, anybody i think even yorkshire had abandoned it by the time we moved out <laughs> <laughs> ஒருமைட் Uh, everybody no, i don't i don't think anybody was in favor of matrix or dose reduced matrix mm-hmm. and um, whole brain rt is uh, obviously not a choice for induction for this otherwise fit 65 year old patient so how many cycles of immuno chemotherapy would we do in this patient would we consider him for a transplant if we do consider him for a transplant would that have a Uh, a, a, a place to say about how many cycles of immuno chemotherapy you would do prior to transplant so can i ask this question to dr balkrishna please yeah so what i have done previously and uh, what we have learned in our training as well is normally we use cytrabine methotrexate rituximab combination in different different dosages based on their uh, uh, you know age and acceptability acceptability of the doses etc and then uh, you complete two full cycles of all combinations and then reassess if there is a, a response of course then you could uh, you know wait and particularly 65 years of age although he is fit uh, you could say that if there is a possibility or chance of relapse uh, then uh, of course at relapse you use thiotepa based uh, autologous transplant but i i don't use thi- any autologous transplant up front even at cr in this patient and the assessment is only after two full cycles of both uh, methotrexate cytorabine and rituximab combinations i don't know what other people feel about and in hiv patients the story is very different if you have hiv associated cns lymphoma then of course uh, think about doing autologous transplant uh, in the first year there was a trial going on the, on in royal free when i was there and then everyone used to get uh, cr1 autologous transplant with thiotepas condition Uh, so in that setting apart from that uh, if uh, in hiv negative setting will uh, the autologous transplant is reserved for uh, relapse and uh, if uh, i'm sorry just just to button say if this is a uh, 30 year old otherwise fit yes. hiv negative what's your take yes. on autographs up front autographs no i i have never learned or done it uh, before even in uh, in uh, very young people uh, it's a really assessment of response trying to achieve the uh, cr Uh, if the first line therapy which is rarely fails uh, uh, combination of methotrexate cytorabine mm-hmm. uh, and then uh, maintenance uh, uh, with rituximab but apart from that i have not uh, really come across using autologous transplant in cr i don't know whether there is a trial or any practice anywhere else uh, even the rituximab maintenance is little controversial some people in, uh, in the uk would use it uh and some people would say it uh, may or may not have any benefit i don't think there is any prospective data on that but uh, i mean usually for my young patient usually i use four cycles of uh, matrix protocol after mm-hmm. two we do reassess uh, whether the patient has gone into cr or not after cr we try to collect uh, stem cells and after four cycle event for transplantation especially for this age group after two, two cycles of your chemotherapy immunochemotherapy you can assess with uh, contrast uh, mri if patient is remission i think for this age group i think it's better to go for transplantation if it's fit enough after two cycles but for younger patients after four cycles and there is a trial which showed after consolidation with uh, autologous transplantation there is a five year survival rate of around 85% for these patients my only worry is what sort of conditioning you can use for these patients in young patient therapy is better particularly if you have already Thiotipa. used thiotepa in matrix if you are in young patient what condition you would use for doing the autologous i mean i think carmestin and thiotepa are the agents which should be used in uh, autologous transplant beam is correct. not recommended and beam has been found to have inferior outcome okay. we did do a transplant carmestin thiotepa based for one of our younger patients after two cycles of matrix so 
All right. I'm, I'm really sorry. I haven't done one uh, autograph at all for Prime Minister Singh as yet. But uh, Kamastin and Tayotipa, uh, Kamastin and uh, 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 Tayotipa base conditioning. Is that is that what? Tayotipa. Yes. Tayotipa. Yes. That is correct. In conditioning, I recommend it. Uh, anybody else used Dusulfan at all? No. No, no. Dusulfan, I think it's very good. Seen as well. And Dusai is almost uh, sort of similar. Similar efficacies in this, but most people have abandoned uh, doing anything apart. I mean, you know, if you were to do a transplant for this category of patients, then carbamazepine therapy is the one. Okay. Uh, yeah. So Nitin, you would use autologous transplant in all primary CNS lymphomas. If, if, if they were fit, yeah, if they were fit, we would uh, transplant everybody. Uh, in fact, uh, this patient also we offered a transplant, uh, sure. but no. Uh, so we are going to consolidate him with some other strategy. Uh, but we we'll probably use hydrozarasi, uh, but obviously they sure. don't need more consolidation. And anyone uses um, uh, rituximab maintenance no. in non-transplant no. uh, eligible patients? No. I'll go with some oral alkylator. Sure. But this is good. Yeah. Sure, sure. Okay. So can we have the next slide, please? So this patient uh, was uh, treated by a very daring hematologist who chose to give matrix mm. with dose reduction uh, of cytorabin and tiotipa. I know the name of the uncle. daring hematologist. <laughs> <laughs> so despite dose reduction, he was admitted for grade three neutropenia and recovered with antibiotics and growth factor support. The family was very apprehensive and was not keen on continuing with chemotherapy. But after a detailed discussion and counselling, the protocol was changed to MTR. He received two cycles of the same without any untoward complications. Can we have the next slide, please? So MRI after two cycles had shown a complete response, and the family, in view of his uh, fitness, uh, and uh, uh, was counselled for uh, about consolidation options and was offered a stem cell. Harvest in anticipation of an autologous stem cell transplant. Hematologist is really daring. <laughs> they refused the stem cell transplant, fearing cytopenias. Uh, so now this patient has received three cycles, three cycles of methotrexate-based uh, uh, immunochemotherapy, and uh, he has refused the stem cell transplant. The MRI showed a complete response after uh, these th three cycles of immunochemotherapy. And uh, how would you uh, would you consolidate this patient? Would you choose chemotherapy for consolidation, or would you choose radiotherapy for consolidation? So, what are the consolidation options that are available for this patient, um, Dr. Dinesh Burani? We have so far used uh, the De Angelis, R, uh, the R, uh, R MVP. 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 So basically, that involves if you are in CR, is a 23.5 gray of radiation and then two doses of cytorabin. So so far we have done this, and uh, someone who has achieved a CR, they have done well with this. Uh, but uh, using a temozolomide or at least a two doses of cytorabin and temozolomide is fine. Mm. There is no one protocol which uh, is being recommended. So you would use cytorabin two doses in this patient and offer temozolomide. We are doing it uh, the 23.5 gray of uh, radiation followed by two cycles of uh, so that's a part of our DNTS protocol. Dr. Sitaram, Dr. Sitaram, can you uh, hear me? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I would, I would probably uh, try and offer in some uh, non-cross-reacting chemotherapy, probably cytorapine and uh, etoposide. Or, or uh, something like R-DIVIC with carboplatin and phosphamide, something which has not been exposed to. I think this patient has a lot of apprehension for cytopenias, probably cytorabin and uh, based uh, consolidation in this gentleman if he's not willing for uh, autologous transplant. That would be my, uh, my approach. Okay, thank you. Um, Dr. Serian? Yeah, um, well, we usually use citrabin, as I said, uh, two doses of citrabin uh, 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 plus or minus 10. That's our uh, usual one. At uh, what dose, sir? At what dose per meter square? Citrabin. Two grams per meter square or three grams? Uh, we use two grams. I'm more than happy with two grams per meter square. Um, uh, uh, but we don't want them. 
uh, even at this age, two gram per meter square is a fairly uh, uh, reasonable dose. We use two grams per meter square. Okay. So can we have the next slide, please? So the consolidation options, as most of the panel has discussed, we have. Would, would, would anybody offer whole brain RT to this patient, given the fact that he's very apprehensive about cytopenias? In case he says, I do not want any cytopenias, and uh, cytorabin, I am not very keen on taking cytorabin. Would we offer whole brain RT? So this 23.5 gray, 23.5 gray as a part of a protocol, uh, but otherwise, uh, if you are on the different protocol now. Uh, the toxicity, whole brain radiotherapy toxicity significantly goes up as we grow older. So it's a question of uh, losing your memory or your cytopenia. Yeah, sure Ray, he's a doctor, so for <laughs> him, cognitive function would be uh, could be of prime importance. Yeah, I think I think he would. I think uh, being a very uh, prominent endocrinologist, I think. He would prefer his, uh, uh, I mean, there are people who do uh, uh, escape without any major problems, but a substantial majority of the older people do have significant cognitive dysfunction uh, over a period of time with uh, uh, radiotherapy. But as I said, I mean, if he has achieved complete remission and uh, uh, I can't think of any uh, 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 major benefit of having radiotherapy, but obviously Dr. Burani feels a bit. Uh, that's right. I mean, the younger people, they tolerate, uh, uh, conversely, uh, whole brain radiotherapy significantly better than the older individuals. So, 65 uh, very uh, uh, active practicing uh, uh, endocrinologists, I probably, particularly who have achieved complete remission, I think uh, whole brain radiotherapy, I probably will discuss with them. Yeah. So, I agree with you, Dr. Sarian. Uh, so can we, uh, I think I'm running out of time. We won't have time for the other cases. So let's just uh, finish up this case. Uh, can we have the next slide, please? So we've already discussed all these three options. And I think uh, the patient finally opted for cytorabin, single dose cytorabin. We have used cytorabin etoposide combination in one of our patients, uh, infusional etoposide. Um, but it was a very intense protocol and the cytopenias were very deep and unfortunately a patient who did very well with MTR during induction, we lost one of our patients to the combination of cytorabin and etoposide. And since then I don't think we have used it for any of our patients. So I think we have, uh, the team had finally decided to just go, uh, go ahead with single agent cytorabin, two cycles for this patient as consolidation. So the last question with this case. Is there a role of maintenance in this particular patient? After receiving methotrexate-based uh, induction chemotherapy, getting into a CR, and after consolidating with two cycles of cytorabin, would you put him on an oral alkylator for maintenance, or would you just say, that's it, and just come for follow-up? I mean, uh, for this age group, there are a couple of studies which showed uh, oral alkylator after giving uh, rituximab in high dose methotrexate, timozolomide for one year has better prognosis, like uh, the oral survival was around 55% at two year survival. Therefore, uh, there are a couple of studies, and the other study showed Procarb was in maintenance. But I don't have experience with that. Yeah. So you would put the patient on temozolomide maintenance yes. for whatever benefit for at least a year? Yes. Yeah. And what about follow-up? How frequently would we do an MRI scan? And um, uh, when is an MRI scan uh, done? Um, usually at the end of treatment. Once every three. What months. is your practice, sir? I, mean, I don't know. Sorry. Usually, what what we do is usually once in four months. Our books is around four months. months. But again, in Indian scenario, you may not be doing that aggressively. I think once in six months would be ideal. Okay. So as, as, as per the BSH guidelines, the, it is recommended to do in the first two years, as you rightly said, once every three to four months, but then uh, financial feasibility should also be taken into consideration. So uh, I don't think I have time for discussing the second and the third cases. The third case was meant to be a teaser, but unfortunately we do not have time. And um, I think Dr. Sood, should I end here? Uh, yes, please. Uh, I think we've run out of time and uh... Um, I want to thank all the panel members 
uh, for mm-hmm. for a very lively discussion and thank you amrita for thank you nitin thank you thank you uh, so thank you for everybody for their attention now final for the final talk of the day i want to invite dr abraham burgis and uh, dr abraham is a dear friend and a and a past colleague and uh, he's done a lot of work in cll so we thought uh, we should hear from him uh, about uh, what he would do if he had a new di- new diagnosis of cll in the current times so abraham over to you good evening everybody thank you nitin come thank you for your kind introduction as well so should i share the screen can you guys see my screen not yet mr abraham can you see it yeah it says started yeah we can see your screen now yeah so the treatment of cerebral palsy or probably is aware has changed dramatically over the last uh, decade from chemotherapy to targeted treatment so um, i in this talk you know, i'm not planning to give um, uh, any biology or uh, epidemiology of cerebral i'm just going straight into the treatment part of cerebral so let's start with the case study uh, this is this is a, a gentleman who was born in 1950 is a retired teacher uh, who presented uh, initially in 2009 with an abnormal fever count on the clinical examination which a white cell count of 14 neutrophils of 4.6 high lymphocyte um a normal hemoglobin and normal platelet count so doesn't have any lymph node or spleen at the time even if you know that we rightly confirmed uh, a CLL phenotype with um, CD5 positive and CD23 positive along with other B cell markers so you all could probably would agree that he has got the diagnosis of a stage A uh, B CLL now what will be uh, so for making a decision on uh, whether this people need treatment or not uh, i think uh, it has been for several years it has been almost the same principle in deciding on whether these people need treatment or not so i think um, in in 70s dr rai and uh, dr binay uh, designed the staging of uh, cll based on the um lymph site count uh, their um, lymph node status and cytopenia and still it's practical to use um, rai and binay staging mainly for making the decision on cll treatment and obviously you know other factors also come into play uh, like the, C, uh, the, the like the symptoms uh, but i think uh, uh, in this gentleman with a stage a cll uh, everybody would agree that uh, he probably won't need any treatment at this point Uh, so even in clinical trials it has been uh, shown to have uh, no benefit uh, even with uh, you know don't think that any of the newer agents trials are complete in stage cll but uh, uh, there has been few trials uh, but nothing has shown a major um, advantage of treating stage cll so this would uh, be the iwcl guideline uh, which was published last in 2018 would go with the conventional uh, treatment indication uh, as such but Uh, even in stage A CLL, there are a few issues that uh, we come across. Even in not even stage A CLL, um, even in MBL, so we report certain issues uh, mainly with um, uh, their uh, immunological status. Um, even in stage A CLL, their immune status is not complete, and they are vulnerable in getting infection. Um, they are more prone for getting uh, autoimmune complications like ITP and um, um, autoimmune hemolytic anemia and second malignancies or other malignancies, especially in older population, uh, is of considerable risk. So we just have to uh, counsel them about these uh, factors, and um, of course um, they need to be uh, the vaccine status needs to be sorry their uh, uh, their antibody status needs to be checked and um, uh, if possible. Uh, vaccinate them with uh, pneumococcal vaccines, and if they are getting recurrent chest infection, especially severe chest infection, needing um, hospital admissions, then uh, and if their immunoglobulin is low, then probably giving prophylactic immunoglobulin um, should be considered in these patients. So that's probably my stage C L L um, uh, management status. Then, in two years later, this chap. Uh, 
have has progressed in his uh, with his disease. His white cell count is 117 now. Uh, his anemic uh, plate count is reasonable. Uh, his direct comb stress is negative, and he's got a normal renal function. Clinical examination uh, revealed cervical and axillary lymph node along with spleen, and the CT confirmed the findings. Now he's transfusion dependent. He has got comorbidities including AF, hypertension, exclusive pleural plaque, and uh, basal cell uh, carcinoma. Uh, again, few investigations that you probably would require uh, at this point, um, and what all uh, investigations you would consider. I'll go over the next few slides and deciding on what all investigations you'll need at this point. Obviously, you'll need all the basic biochemistry, virology, um, and uh, other status, but uh, considering the prognostic markers in CLL, there has been a dramatic change uh, or, you know, on the um, investigations that you would consider. Say, in the 1970s, you only had the morphology. Even for, not just for diagnosis, you know, even for prognostications, you had uh, various morphological patterns, especially the infiltration in the uh, marrow, the morphology of the lymphocytes, like pro, if you have more pro-lymphocytes, then uh, you're at high risk, uh, you've got a poor prognosis compared to uh, a low number of pro-lymphocytes. And then uh, over the years, the um, uh, close metric has evolved uh, uh, from diagnosis to prognostication, so you know that um, Sub-70 and CD38, et cetera, are considered as flow markers, which is for the core prognosis. Uh, later, we know that they are surrogate markers for immunoglobulin G mutation status. Um, and uh, to us, uh, uh, in, in, in 2000s, uh, fish has come across in a big leap, and uh, several cytogenetic markers uh, based on fish has been found to have good prognostic implication on the uh, in, in management of the CLL patients. Now, uh, advancing beyond that, now we have, uh, uh, we now know very well that even uh, uh, in, uh, in addition to some DNP deletion, TP53 mutation status is also quite important, uh, especially based on single sequencing initially. Now, moving on to the next generation sequencing and even whole genomic sequence. Um, but uh, in clinical practice, it's probably quite important now uh, doing the uh, mutational status in the T53 uh, before deciding the, the treatment of these patients. So this is a, a classic uh, slide you might have all uh, seen before in 2000, uh, uh, in, in, in early 2000s. Um, Donna Rakhtar published in New England Journal of Medicine on the prognostic implication of various cytolytic, fish-based cytolytic markers. So, uh, 13Q, which is the most common abnormality, has got a, a good outcome compared to even normal cytogenetic population. So, uh, to have trisomy 12, which, which, are, which is in par with the normal cytogenetics, and uh, ATM delete, sorry, uh, 11Q deletion, which goes along uh, with the ATM uh, gene, again, uh, has got a, a poor uh, prognosis uh, compared to normal cytogenetics. And of uh, compared to all these, 17 p deletion status has got the worst outcome. Uh, this is despite all um, uh, what you call all the immunochemotherapy uh, agents. 17 p stands out um, as a very poor uh, prognostic marker. In de novo CLL, probably uh, less than 10 percent will have a 17 p deletion, and uh, 13 q probably is the most common. But uh, in, in total, you can see that around 82 percent of uh, uh, um, the CLL patients, <coughs> CLL patients have got a cytogenetic abnormality. Um, the other, uh, the other major uh, prognostic factor is the uh, immunoglobulin gene mutation. So you know that uh, when these cell uh, mature, they are exposed to, uh, 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 they, they are exposed to antigens, and when they go through the maturation process, the, the, the uh, antigen-based mutation happens in CLL. And, now, we know that the mutated CLL has got a much better outcome compared to um, the unmutated CLL. So, uh, but there are few exceptions, even in mutated CLL, um, a very small subgroup called sub subset 2 has got a poor outcome, and that outcome is probably compared with, uh, comparable with the unmutated CLL. Now, um, Based on this, uh, you know that you know the treatment uh, uh, in CLL has evolved um, over the last um, uh, couple of decades from chemotherapy, single agent oral chemotherapy agents to combination chemotherapy and to chemoimmunotherapy, and now to, to the newer um, targeted treatment. So 
The prognostic markers that we have seen before are all analyzed in the chemotherapy era or probably chemoimmunotherapy era. Now, in the chemoimmunotherapy era, now we know that you know uh, some of these cytogenetic markers are of not much relevance. For, for example, a chem deletion or 11P deletion has got much uh, implication when we are combining chemotherapy with immunotherapy. But 17P still stands out as a poor prognostic marker. So in 2016, uh, the international working groups working group has come up with a, uh, an IPI international prognostic index calculation with uh, uh, different grading for different prognostic markers, which giving uh, a, a very high uh, grading for 17p deletion or TP53 mutational status. Then um, beyond that, um, immunoglobin gene mutation status, the beta, beta to microglobin level clinical staging and age were taken into consideration. So if you got a low score, then your chance of surviving five years is around 93%. But if you got a very high score, your chance of surviving is only around 20, 23%. And uh, they've clearly grouped the patients into four categories based on the IPI score. Now, when considering the treatment of CLL, it's not just the prognostic score and other uh, factors is important. As you know, CLL is um, a disease of the elderly, and uh, probably the median age of presentation is around uh, 72 years. This is based on the uh, data we've got from the Western studies, but uh, we haven't got much data from India. Uh, in this age group, <coughs> as you all know, the uh, majority of the patients with cancers have got a lot of comorbidities. And uh, uh, in CLL, uh, you can see that uh, the, the patient carries around 89% of this patient carries at least one form of the and 46% uh, of this patient have more, more than one major uh, form of the um, This is based on a very large cohort of patients from the Mayo Clinic uh, from 1995 to 2006. So this is a major factor that needs to be considered when uh, considering the uh, treatment for CLL. So uh, coming back to my patient, uh, he was treated initially in 2011. So his cytogenetics showed a trisomy 12, uh, which uh, probably will have the same um, prognostic information as, for, uh, as with the normal uh, cytogenetics. So at that time, this is a patient who was treated in the UK. So at that time, uh, the chemoimmunotherapy was a standard there, and uh, he received fluoroglobin, cyclophosphamide, and rituximab, which you probably all would agree. Uh, would be the treatment for a fit um, young patient uh, who can tolerate uh, this sort of treatment. Now, what data we've got? You know, we've got a, a huge data on um, combining the fitzinab with fluoroglobin uh, uh, and uh, cyclophosphamide, and I'm not going into the details of those data. Now, CLL8 is probably the uh, largest randomized controlled trial um, comparing uh, FC versus FCR. And in this, um, uh, uh, the long-term follow-up of this trial has shown that uh, there is a cohort of patients uh, who um, are mutated. That this is, uh, you know, for the mutated cohort of patients, there are uh, a subset of patients who are still stay, staying in remission of several years after the treatment. And uh, you can see that uh, the uh, the, uh, the survival curve is almost plateauing for this uh, cohort of patients. So. Uh, have we, you know, we might have reached a point where uh, this subset of patients that we can call uh, probably as a cure. Um, and uh, these uh, mutated patients, this subset of mutated patients do very well with chemoimmunotherapy with FCR. So, and now you can see that in this um, trial itself, the data uh, showing um, definitely some GMP has got a very poor outcome compared to all other uh, risk groups um, when treated with FCR. Now, this is probably uh, translated across all trials, uh, 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 you know, comparing FC versus FCR. So there are three major trials. The first one was from India Anderson Group, which is a phase two trial, uh, followed by a CLL8 trial from the German group, and then the Italian retrospective analysis. All has uh, shown that a, a, a subgroup of patients who are mutated for the immunoglobulin gene um, uh, are going into a plateauing phase that we possibly could attain a cure uh, in this uh, uh, group of patients. 
Now, FCR is not a light undertaking. Um, as you see, the, to the toxicity profile of FCR, um, I, uh, you, you probably would agree that um, you know the immediate toxicity of um, cytopenia along with infection uh, of FCR is a, a major problem, especially uh, when we are treating um, our cohort of patients in India. Uh, and I, I'm pretty sure that in a lot of us would be quite apprehensive in giving FCR um, even at this uh, stage, uh, e even for any fit patients. So uh, it is a it is not a light undertaking, but um, it, 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 for majority of the patients, you still can uh, go with FCR um, if they are young and fit. And uh, the toxicity, as we say, it's not just the uh, immediate complications. Now we have got data from. Uh, long follow-up of patients on FC and FCR, and now we've seen uh, long-term toxicity like secondary cancers. Um, so from uh, the, uh, uh, the the FCR data, uh, it has shown that uh, around 6% will develop uh, solid tumors, and um, uh, MDS and uh, AML is another risk, um, uh, which uh, is shown in around 5% of patients, and rectal transformation, which is um, even um, you know, without treatment is an intrinsic risk factor for CLL, but uh, with treatment, uh, we've seen around 9% going in for uh, rich transformation. So there are you know, immediate complications as well as long-term complications for FCR. Now, trying to, um, to uh, de-escalate uh, de the intensity of um, FCR treatment, um, German group again has done mostly, uh, you know, the big trials in CLL has been done by the German groups. Um, so uh, the CLL 10 compared the BR uh, with uh, FCR. Um, again, uh, this is, uh, uh, this is uh, for fit patients, this is to try and see whether um, de escalating the dose or intensity of the treatment uh, would be good enough to uh, have uh, long term remission. But uh, it is shown that um, when you do splitting the patients uh, below the age of 65 and above the age of 65, there is definite uh, disadvantage for uh, BR in patients below the age of uh, 65 uh, in, terms, in terms of uh, progression free survival. But this has not been translated, the difference has not been translated to patients above the age of 65. Now, this is probably not seen in uh, a, a, registry, a registry data from a large registry data from um, US uh, uh, based on community practice. Um, they have shown that BR has probably got similar outcome as FCR, but we have to take that uh, this is a retrospective uh, data collection and analysis, so we just have to take it with a bit of caution. Now, in um, older unfit patients uh, who are not fit enough even to get, receive BR, uh, what have we moved across from single agent chlorambucil to immunochemotherapy? And definitely, uh, in this group of patients, also there is an advantage of combining um, chlorambucil based treatment with immunotherapy. So, again, German uh, CLL 11 trial has shown that. Chlorambucil uh, compared to chlorambucil or venetuzumab or chlorambucil rituximab, this is a three arm trial you know, compared to chlorambucil rituximab, um, has got definite uh, improvement in time to next, uh, you know, time to next treatment, uh, as well as um, you know, there, uh, there is a survival advantage, overall survival advantage when compared to chlorambucil on its own. Uh, even though obinutuzumab has shown some advantage uh, in combining uh, 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 on, in comparison with the rituximab, um, uh, this is only a, a, a favoring effect and the, 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 the overall survival has not reached um, in both uh, arms yet. Now, moving on beyond the chemo, chemo immunotherapy era, now we've got several newer agents um, uh, in the treatment armamentarium of uh, CLL uh, probably in the last decade, and uh, most of them has been approved uh, in non trial context from 2015 onwards. Uh, so you all will be familiar with these names of abrutinib, idelalisib, venetoclox, now acalabrutinib. Uh, all these agents are all been approved now in, uh, in, uh, for use in CLL. Now, uh, looking into the uh, mechanism of action of these drugs, now um, 
CLL uh, cell proliferation is highly de dependent on the BCR signaling pathway, the signalosome, uh, which uh, has caused several downstream molecules, including LIN6, BTK, PIP, delta kinase, et cetera, et cetera, which stimulate downstream signal to an NF kappa B pathway, and uh, which uh, transcribe the uh, uh, the which transcribe the signal uh, to the nucleus and then the cell proliferation. So if you inhibit any of these molecules uh, in this pathway, then it can be reflected into um, uh, you know disease treatment of CLL. So several molecules have been inhibited, including. Sick Lin, sorry, sick BTK, BI3 delta kinase um, uh, in this context, in the um, missile receptor context. And um, uh, even though uh, all these molecules have been tried, only the BTK inhibitors has been found to be uh, highly effective, uh, even though BI3 delta kinase inhibitors, uh, idealism has been found to be highly effective. The toxicity profile of this drug is not. Uh, very favorable. So this is not this is grown out of popularity at the moment. Now the uh, other uh, target for treatment in CLM is um, of course the apoptotic pathway. So uh, if you inhibit the uh, and the apoptotic mechanism, uh, the BCL2 uh, pathway, then you can attain um, the, the destruction of the CLL cells as well. So this is so this is uh, uh, this is also taken into um, what you call a big leap taken into a leap, big leap in the treatment of uh, CLL. So this is probably the proof of concept trial in the introduction of um, ibrutinib, um, uh, PCYC1102 and 1103 trials in relapsed refractory and treatment naive CLL. You can see that the in treatment naive CLL um, five year survival has. Uh, reached up to a point of 92%, which is a dramatic uh, outcome difference um, compared to previous uh, immunochemotherapy era. Even in relapsed or factory patients, uh, the overall survival has uh, reached uh, in five years to around 57%, which is again a big achievement in CLL treatment. Moving on to the randomized control trial uh, in the, um, the, the, the for the ibrutinib, the resonate, and the resonate 2 trial, the resonate trial initially for relapsed refractory patients, and the resonate 2 trial for the uh, first line treatment uh, for older patients. So, in the resonate trial, the ibrutinib single agent was compared with ofitumumab. Of course, you may ask why ofitumumab? Ofitumumab was the only uh, standard treatment uh, at that time uh, used for double refractory uh, patients who were refractory to FCR and alemtuzumab. Uh, and alemtuzumab, uh, again, you know that uh, it may attain a very good remission, but a sustained remission is not feasible at all with alemtuzumab. It's not a normal antibody, you know, CD20 antibody on its own. So you can see that there is a uh, uh, there is a dramatic difference in PFS between ibrutinib and, and the alemtuzumab. And in, uh, uh, in first line treatment was made two trial. Uh, again, the standard treatment at that time was chloramazole on its own, and I would have has shown uh, a, a significant um, uh, difference uh, com in comparison to uh, chloramazole. Uh, so this is uh, this has been across the subgroups. You can see that for the uh, immunoglobulin uh, mutated and unmutated patients, the Resonate 2 2 has shown no difference at all. And for uh, the uh, across the uh, genetic uh, 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 genetic categories, also there are not much difference between, and you can see that even uh, in some gene P deleted or TB3 mutated patients, the outcome is not uh, as bad uh, compared to other um, uh, subgroups. Now, looking into the toxicity profile of um, uh, the ibrutinib uh, uh, as a single agent, uh, it's a fairly well tolerated drug when you, uh, when you, when you start using ibrutinib. There were a lot of uh, uh, niggling issues like rashes, uh, aphalgia, diarrhea, and cytopenia, and uh, etc. Et but none of this has been a major um, uh, clinical um, uh, consequences, but uh, there were significant. Um, I would say significant grade toxicity with uh, regards to uh, cardiotoxicity in terms of a fibrillation and hypertension, uh, but again, quite manageable uh, with um, the supportive treatment. So it hasn't been a major 
uh, issue. Uh, the, the only other problem was there was, uh, there was uh, significant uh, bleeding, especially when we start um, uh, the treatment in cytopenic patients. So it's fairly well tolerated drug uh, in all uh, age group of patients. Now, moving on, whether we have got any advantage of combining ibrutinib uh, with uh, uh, anti CD20 antibodies. Um, three trials comparing uh, different uh, cohort of population. Um, you have the ACOG 1912 trial uh, comparing FCR for any fit patients, uh, 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 comparing IR, the ibrutinib rituximab with FCR for any fit patients. Then you have uh, a triple arm trial uh, for uh, less fit patients who are able to tolerate BR. Um, the, that's uh, uh, ibrutinib on its own, ibrutinib R uh, versus uh, BR. And then you have the Illuminate trial uh, comparing uh, optumab ibrutinib uh, 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 along with uh, um, chlorambucil ibrutinib. So these are the uh, three trials. Um, which uh, uh, has compared um, immuno immunotherapy or combined immunotherapy with Ibrutinib. Only, I think only the uh, Alliance trial has had three arms comparing you know, single agent Ibrutinib along with single agent Ibrutinib uh, combined with Ibrutinib. So you can see in all these trials there has been a significant progress-free survival advantage uh, in Ibrutinib-based arms compared to chemo immunotherapy arms. And, uh, uh, this has been again, as uh, mentioned in, uh, sorry, I just have to mention one point in here. So in the uh, Alliance trial, you can see that uh, there's no much probably survival advantage of combining the uh, uh, uh in compared with single agent ibuprofen. Uh, so it, this is, a, you know, translating across the uh, subgroups in uh, immunoglobulin uh, mutated and mutated uh, and uh, Across the three, three, three trials, you know, you can see survival advantage even in a mutated population. So you have um, uh, uh, cytogenetic uh, abnormality subgroups as well here. You can see that um, ibrutinib, uh, again, is, even though the number is quite small, um, you can see only 11 patients in the IR arm and the uh, ibrutinib arm has only had nine patients, but definitely. Um, even with 17 p deletion, there is no survival disadvantage uh, for this patient when combining ibuprofen with anti CD20. Uh, so, whether there is a difference in the overall survival uh, in these uh, trials, now we have uh, ECOP 1912 for N3 patients. It is shown a statistically significant uh, survival difference uh, between. Um, IR and uh, the uh, FCR arm, but uh, the uh, other two trials did not show any uh, significant difference in the overall survival. Now moving into the toxicity profile of these drugs, similar to, I would say, um, uh, in all these trials, it's similar to ibrutinib on its own, uh, but obviously, you know, you have uh, more infusion-related um, uh, Infusion related uh, toxicity if you combine that with uh, abiritismab, um, which is all quite manageable um, in this patient. So, now moving on to the next generation BTK inhibitor, uh, we have a calibrutinib, which is again now approved for uh, use of a trial. Uh, this is probably the first randomized control trial, the Elevate trial uh, in. Um, First line treatment in CLL again um, in in older patients uh, uh, you know who had comorbidities. A triple arm trial Akala with um, uh, uh, then Akala on its own, and, uh, and then uh, the third arm is Tuarambasol uh, Abilitismab. Again, uh, you can see that there is a significant difference uh, between the chemo and therapy um, compared to uh, Akala based. Uh, Arms, and, but there's not much difference between Akala single agent along with or combining with uh, immunotherapy. Now, this is a central uh, comparing um, uh, calibrotinib uh, versus um, in, in relapsed refractory patients, calibrotinib versus uh, investigator's choice. You can choose uh, um, on your preference 
IDLAN SIM plus retics map or uh, vendor retics map. Uh, IDLAN SIM was uh, still an active drug uh, when this trial was open, but uh, you know, as I said before, you know, it's gone out of fashion. It's, only, it's used only in rare circumstances nowadays. Again, showing a significant difference in the probability of survival um, in, uh, in, in a KLA arm compared to the other arm. Again, the toxicity profile is similar to the BTK inhibitor, um, other uh, the BTK inhibitor, but um, compared to ibrutinib, Akala probably is better tolerated in terms of the cardiotoxicity if your fibrillation and hypertension is probably less, and bleeding manifestation is also probably less in Akala. So in people who are intolerant uh, to ibrutinib, Akala is probably an option. Now, moving on to the next uh, uh, completely different uh, agent, um, targeting on the VCL2. Uh, we have Benetoclox now approved. Uh, this is the phase three trial data of uh, Benetoclox uh, Murano trial, global uh, multicentric trial run across several countries. Um, again, showing significant difference um, in relapsed refractory patients, significant differences in the published phase survival. Uh, yeah, uh, when comparing with uh, when the mustard uh, 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 when for when 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 it works with rituximab compared to the mustard rituximab, so you can see on the uh, right side there is um, an overall survival difference, uh, even though the patients who were on the rituximab uh, who progressed later were allowed to keep uh, in you know with. Uh, novel uh, targeted treatment. Even with, uh, you know, these people were allowed to treat later with clock or novel targeted treatment, the uh, overall survival, there was a significant overall survival difference um, uh, between these two groups. Uh, now, CLL-14 trial, the German CLL-14 trial, again, coexisting medical condition, patients with coexisting medical conditions uh, comparing uh, for the Ritismab chlorambucil, uh, versus uh, uh, and it now there is a significant uh, uh, difference in progression based survival uh, between these two arms uh, in this group of patients as well. Again, uh, now we just have to look a bit careful in this data uh, in venetoclox abilitismab, but there is a, a difference in the progression based survival in the 17p deleted or typically mutated patients. And, uh, even though this is the insulin deletion patient, it's, it's definitely better than uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, chemiomonotherapy arm. Uh, there is a, a significant difference between um, uh, some non deleted or people to the uh, unmutated patients to mutated patients. So, this probably is due to the fact that. Obviously, with venetoclox um, uh, and um, abolitismab, we stopped treatment um, in a year's time uh, compared to um, uh, BTK inhibitors, which we carry on treatment, uh, carry on treating under progression or um, intolerance. So there is, you know, after stopping treatment, there is a, a definite uh, a clonal advantage for the CLL cells, uh, which has been dormant, uh, which research as a, a potential relapse with, uh, if you have some DNP deletion clone uh, earlier uh, in the treatment, so once you stop the treatment. Again, uh, for attainment of MRD negativity, venetoclox uh, has shown a significant um, uh, difference in the MRD attainment status. So I'm, I haven't included uh, MRD data in my talk much, but uh, we now clearly know that people who attain MRD negativity at the end of the treatment has got a definite uh, uh, bet, uh, better progress uh, free survival and overall survival. This has been shown in several randomized control trials and several retrospective analysis. So, whatever the treatment, if you attain an MRD negativity at the end of your treatment, then you have definitely a better outcome in terms of both progress free survival and overall survival. So, uh, when abilitismab, uh, you know, here the MRD acts as a surrogate marker. So, when uh, abilitismab clearly shows a uh, uh, a significant advantage in obtaining a marvin activity as well. Now, coming to the toxicity of uh, venetoclox and venetoclox, um, again, you know, uh, you, uh, you probably is aware that uh, venetoclox in the initial phase one trials, there has been a couple of deaths uh, with tumor lysis, which has been a dramatic change in the treatment of CLL because nobody expected tumor lysis in uh, CLL treatment. So 
uh, very cautious nowadays. It's not a major issue because there is a, um, a definite uh, protocol for uh, ramping up the dose of clinical clocks and the risk assessment of uh, the tumor load in patients before you start the clinical clocks. So it's not a major issue nowadays, but it has to be very careful uh, with tumor lysis um, uh, when treating patients with clinical clocks. Um, uh, so uh, the VO has given you know, reasonable tox profile with cytopenias, infection, uh, but beyond that, uh, it's been a relatively well tolerated drug if you pass over the initial tumor lysis phase carefully. Uh, now, a couple of uh, slides. Abraham? Am I right? Yeah, could I just, yeah, I just um, interrupt? We are running out of time. Fine, fine, so. fine, fine. I'll stop here. I'll stop yeah. here. We can take some questions. I'll go on if you don't. So uh, I don't think that you know these slides are quite you know this probably is one of the uh, slides I made. So this is probably the rationale of treatment. We can still use uh, immunochemotherapy-based regimen in patients who are especially mutated. So few take-home messages. So before start treating patients, 17 p deletion and mutational status is very important, and your immunoglobulin. Uh, gene mutation status because that will decide on the treatment. If you are un if you are mutated, then you have a uh, your FCR immunochemotherapy is still a very good option for treating those patients. But if you have uh, unmutated gene or seventeen um, p deletion or t fifty mutation status, then uh, you probably not you probably better off with a. a uh, with a uh, targeted uh, treatment if you if it is available, but obviously you know in Indian situation it's quite difficult. So I'll stop here and uh, let's move on with say, taking some questions if there is any baby. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> now I'll open the house. Abraham will be quite happy to answer them. Right. Uh, can I just ask a quick one? Sure. Have a patient who's young and fit and who, who is unmutated with 17p negative, first diagnosis, first treatment. Uh, what kind of treatment would you offer this patient in, in the current times when you have access to everything? Probably we have inclination to go for unmutated patients. The inclination is to yeah. go for, go for um, newer agents. Uh, in the current site. So if you have uh, availability of the newer agents, you've, you know, it has been clearly shown that um, in unmutated patients, the FCR is probably not a good option. Uh, so if you have availability of the newer agents, uh, any of the newer agents, so, you know, you've got both BTK-based treatment and um, BCL2-based treatment. Yeah, I mean, I think BCL2-based treatment, we don't have access to, but at least we have yeah. BTK and uh, we have Ibrutinib and even generic Ibrutinib and we'll have access to Acalabrutinib hopefully soon. So if you have option uh, and the cost is not a big issue for the patient, then that probably would be a better option. Perfect. Thank you. Abraham? Uh, I think uh, Subhash is trying to talk. I think Subhash, you are muted. Subhash, do you have a question? No, I, I don't think he has a question. Oh, so right, 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 right. And we've run out of time, so he can ask you his question uh, later on, I think. Ah, I'm sorry. Uh, no, <laughs> so thank you, Abraham, for that lovely talk and uh, hearing our concepts of, of CLL. Uh, so I'll pass the uh, mic back on to uh, Dr. Beth, uh, who's going to give us a closing remark. Thank, so, thank you, Nitin, and uh, thanks, everyone for uh, energizing our uh, efforts and making the program such a huge success. We had more than 200 uh, people participating online. And uh, in addition to the faculty who were uh, here uh, with us and uh, wonderful uh, discussions, a lot of education, a lot of take home messages. Thanks everyone, stay safe and take care. And I thank uh, Rajesh once again and the team. He has wonderful job done. And uh, once again, the sponsor, Intas Pharmaceuticals, and the team Medanta for uh, all the support and the effort uh, rendered in, in organizing this program. Thank you once again, and stay safe.
Good night. Thank you. Good night. Bye.